<laughs> all right, good evening. How are we all doing? Good. Okay. How are we doing? Woo! All right. So welcome to our uh, nth twed of the fall 2018 uh, season. Uh, uh, the next uh, the next few Wednesday evenings are going to be up the hill again. There's an RPI, our users group. There will, there's going to be an idea talk uh, by Hannah. I think I think Candace is next. Um, but it's like a month. What's that? Three weeks. Three weeks. Well, in a, in a human amount of time. Um, just a, a couple of dis logistics, and we'll get going. Uh, we are streaming live uh, out to the internet. Everybody, say hi to the inter internet. Hi, internet. Hi, internet. Hi, internet. All right. Hello, awesome. world. <laughs> Hello, world. Um, uh, thank you very much, Katie. This is Katie's tenth uh, TWED talk <laughs> on various different topics. Um, She's going to focus on uh, policy expression with ontology. No, she's going to focus on. Uh, uh, I'll let her describe it. Uh, yeah. So gender and the binary or lack thereof. All right. So, and uh, questions are welcome throughout. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Discussion, uh, shouting. Uh, just don't storm into the streets. Don't don't form a caravan. Yeah. Uh, well, storm into the streets like afterwards. But exactly. Yeah. All right. So take it away, Kate. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Hyman and Sean. Um, yes, jumping right in. Um, I want to talk about sort of like the notion of like, biological sex and like sort of teasing what exactly that means because uh, it can mean a variety of different things actually. Um, some terminology, uh, sort of focusing on transgender issues, just you know, because I know a lot of terminology is new and might not be familiar to everyone. Um, and some so, some of the the basics of like where we are in terms of health across the gender spectrum, uh, however you want to think of it, and sort of a little bit about the history of how we got there. And then I took a look at some of our favorite ontologies to sort of examine how they handle gender. And you know, I was just sort of thinking about you know, sort of preliminarily how we might be able to improve this representation to be more complete and more accurate hopefully in a way that would be beneficial, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, more people in uh, the medical field. So biological sex, um, in top corner, we have sort of like the traditional view, uh, XX is a woman, XY is a man. Um, so biological sex could be your chromosomes, um, but there are also a variety of disorders of sexual development that can result in intersex conditions. Um, some of which involve uh, duplication or deletion of um, these sex chromosomes. Uh, oh, so you uh, can't actually be sure unless you're, you're tested, your chromosomes, you get your chromosomes tested, you know, if you are actually XXXY. Um, and most people don't, don't undergo this. Um, hormones, uh, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Um, we have them in different levels in our bodies depending on how our bodies have told us to produce them. Um, they differ in different people, they differ across genders, they differ over time. So it's really, if you're looking only at hormones, then sex is a very fluid thing in that regard. Um, we also have the primary sex characteristics, um, the gonads that produce either eggs or sperm, uh, the reproductive organs involved in making a baby, the external reproductive organs in making a baby. Um, and that would be, you know, the doctors generally will assign a gender at birth based on the external genitalia. Just so you look at the baby, what do you see? Is this a boy or a girl? Uh, and there's also the secondary sex characteristics, which are generally affected by the hormones. And these include things like um, how your body distributes muscle mass, fat, and body hair. Um, you, you, it's like, you know, sort of the dreaded things that happen when we go through puberty, right? You start getting fat and hair in different places. And that's affected also by your hormones. And sometimes we use sex and gender interchangeably. Um, I think generally gender is used more uh, to encompass the social roles, whereas sex is generally more of, you know, these different biological functions. But, you know, it also encompasses certain social roles, which may also differ uh, across societies. So here's some, some terminology. Um, transgender <coughs> is cisgender. So uh, transgender is you know, don't identify with the gender that you were assigned at birth. And cisgender is the opposite of that. So if you do identify with the gender you were assigned at birth, then you are cisgender. 
and um, the trans community is sort of um, working to highlight both of these terms to promote the idea that one is, a, it's, it's not like you are normal or you are transgender. Um, they're both normal conditions that can occur in people and we should accept them as such. There's just different degrees of it. Different Where does this cis come from? It's just Latin. Yeah. What's that? It's Latin. It's the antonym for trans. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then we have differences between gender identity and gender expression. Uh, essentially, identity is uh, what you feel on the inside, who you, who you are, what gender you identify with personally. And this may be the same or different as your gender expression, which is sort of the external, you can almost think of it as a performance socially of your gender. Um, Gender expression would be short hair versus long hair. I wear makeup, but I wear it in weird colors. Um, you know, the sort of style of clothing that you wear and, and so forth. Um, it may also be uh, like certain mannerisms or speech patterns. And again, that's a lot of this is largely dependent on uh, your, you know, your social group that differs across races and cultures. And then um, you'll see sometimes uh, the terms like assigned male at birth or designated female at birth. And that sort of um, some basic terminology to convey that, you know, when the baby is born, the doctor essentially, you know, looks at it and says, okay, this is my best guess of the baby's sex, essentially. And so you may have, you would have male or female put on the birth certificate at birth. And that may or may not be what that, that person, that individual identifies with as they grow up. And so we sort of um, use this terminology to sort of highlight that um, this is the sex that they were assigned at birth. And, you know, maybe for most people, they identify with that same sex uh, later in life, but not for everyone. Uh, gender dysphoria is um, your uh, distress between your your physical uh, sex and your gender identity, uh, like what you were assigned at birth and what you believe you are inside. Um, and this is actually in the, the DSM-5 right now. They use the term gender dysphoria now, uh, replacing gender identity disorder to sort of uh, remove the stigma behind it. It's not really a disorder so much as it's like there's this incongruence and you know we're developing more and more ways that we are able to treat this and fix it to make you feel more like the person that you identify as. And sometimes this is in the form of sex reassignment surgery, uh, also called gender confirmation surgery. And this actually covers um, a variety of different procedures, uh, alterations to the primary sex characteristics or to the secondary sex characteristics. Um, you can have, if there are some individuals will choose to undergo some of these procedures, um, none of these procedures, um, you know, different combinations of them. So it's sort of up to the individual um, how exactly they want to pursue this sort of this medical transition uh, through surgery. But the idea is that not everyone has the same experience essentially, and not everyone goes to necessarily all of these for the set to go from male to female or female to male. And so beyond just, you know, M or F in the check boxes, we have, uh, as I mentioned, a variety of intersex conditions, Kleinefelter syndrome, uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome, which by itself has uh, several degrees uh, of expression, uh, Turner syndrome, trisomy X, those are chromosomal disorders where uh, with elimination or duplication of an X chromosome. And then there are a variety of uh, gender identity terms that you may have seen uh, crop up especially in the last several years as we've sort of come to understand more about who we are and how we want to identify. And so that could be things like agender, non-binary, gender neutral, um, which is a sort of an identification with a lack of gender. Um, there's uh, bi-gender and uh, pan-gender for sort of more of a encompassing both. Uh, there's gender fluid for it sort of changes. And there's uh, things like demi boy and male of center for um, me identifying more with one gender, but not completely. And then we also have some ideas like uh, third gender and the Native American two spirit, which um, often come to us from other other cultures, non Western traditions, which um, in a lot of cases for a very long time have had sort of different uh, social 
genders in addition to what we think of as male and female. So there's a lot of varieties of ways that this comes up um, in a variety of places. And it's important because different bodies have different needs. So we can't really accurately describe everyone with just a checkbox M or F, right? Uh, we have to take into account maybe uh, medical history things, how they self-identify. Um, and this is also important because there's a lot of uh, this, uh, lack of research in many areas um, on you know different areas on certain minority populations. And also social climates, especially in the last 150 years, have had a lot of effect on what we do and don't talk about in terms of human sexuality. And I think that you know, the medical field hurts from this, that, you know, we're not taking as good care of people as we should be or could be. Um, as Brenda's mentioned in her talk uh, last semester, there's a lot of examples of women being underrepresented in clinical trials. Um, elderly women in clinical trials, this was an article I found, they're looking at uh, heart conditions, and they just, you know, men and women have equal problems with cardiovascular trouble, but they don't have any clinical trials involving women for treatment. Um, and also the addressing barriers to inclusion of pregnant women in clinical trials. Um, the abstract was discussing women who basically had to like drop her bipolar disorder medication cold turkey because they just didn't know what it would do um, while she was pregnant. And so it's sort of like, you know, you understand that there's some reasons for care with pregnancy in clinical trials, but it's still something, you know, there are hormonal changes going on there that we need to think about that can be important to uh, your care needs and requirements. Um, trans individuals often uh, are excluded and they often also avoid seeking treatment, uh, preventive treatment or reactive treatment because of barriers, um, including transphobia and also just uh, general lack of understanding. Um, it looks like there's a lot of research in particular into HIV treatment and transmission among uh, trans individuals which is sort of a societal pressure thing as um, they're uh, very, especially trans women are very susceptible to HIV because um, social barriers to employment uh, force a lot of them into sex work, unfortunately. And so like on one hand, it's good that we are looking at ways to better, you know, treat people with those conditions, but we also, you know, need, we need to, you know, make social changes, but also we need to look at um, other health requirements that these populations have. <clears throat> and then part of how we got here is um, there was uh, Magnus Hirschfeld and Arthur Kronfeld uh, opened essentially a, a sexology research institute in Weimar, Germany in the early 1900s between the wars. And they actually had a lot of work, a lot of publications. Um, they employed a lot of um, gay, lesbian, and trans people, you know, even in roles such as housekeeper and so forth. So they were they were seen as sort of a safe space for the homosexual community. And they did research into, um, you know, cisgender homosexual health and as well as, um, excuse me, trans health. And in that institute, uh, Dora Richter was the first woman that we know about to undergo um, some of the gender confirmation surgery procedures. And then in 1933, we lost all of this information that had been collected and researched when the Nazis seized the entire collection and burned it in the street. <laughs> so we could have a lot more information that, you know, we could be building upon what they learned in the early 1900s, but we unfortunately lost a lot of that knowledge. And so as a result, um, it's not maybe discussed uh, as much as it could be. I know I spoke with um, Tara Schuster, the health educator at RPI, and she said that, you know, a lot of places, you know, I've heard this from other doctors as well, a lot of places you don't get as much education on human sexuality. So, you know, it's not necessarily a malicious thing, but a lot of doctors just don't know. And so we have, you know, lots of these questions that we need better address. Where can a woman go to have prostate cancer screening? Uh, what options are available to a man with a family history of cervical cancer? And, um, you know, going back to the example of the woman with bipolar disorder, what, what can she safely take? And um, how can we sort of include people like her in clinical trials safely and effectively? And just sort of um, 
in a more general social sense, how can we make the doctor's office a safer and more comfortable place for transgender, gender nonconforming um, patients? <clears throat> and then um, how do the different sex hormones affect various disorders? Like there's fairly recent research into um, estrogen's effect on pain and migraines. Um, and there are other diseases that are known to affect um, women more often than men or men more often than women. And so there may be sort of hormonal aspects that we can examine more to sort of get a better idea of, um, excuse me, what, what members of different populations need. And so I looked at some of the ontologies that we use in vocabularies just to sort of see what the notions of gender are. Um, SNOMED CT has it as a type of general general clinical state, and they have sort of a variety of enumerated types, essentially, um, which I think it's, it's fairly comprehensive, but they, they talk about the surgical transitions without really specifying what sort of surgery. Um, you can have um, testes removed as a trans woman, um, and then obviously you wouldn't be at risk of testicular cancer, but um, breast reduction, breast augmentation, surgeries um, might still, uh, you might still develop breast cancer. So I feel like um, they would need a bit more granularity there, especially in terms of like the, the surgery. And also um, as some individuals elect to not go through surgery, but still use um, hormone replacement therapy, that's something that also needs to be accounted for. Uh, semantic science integrated ontology has it as a subclass of an object quality. So they're not, they have male, female, and intersex. Um, and it's the, based on reproductive function. So it's sort of a, a narrow definition in that sense, but I feel like it's also very targeting since they're talking specifically about the reproductive organs. Uh, human phenotype ontology, I was looking through that, and that looks like it's mostly focused on. Um, sort of the genetic expression. So they have coverage of like some of the uh, genetic mutations and so forth and the resulting symptoms, but they don't really have um, definitions for, for gender or sex there. <clears throat> and so, I don't know, better for better representation, I feel like we would need like sort of a, a, a multi-axis spectrum here with say with the sex, male, female, and the birth certificate is the, the principal component of your, your gender. Hmm. It's, only, it's only part of it. So you have your, your sex designation at birth, um, how you self-identify chromosomal abnormalities, the status of your hormones, and any, any surgeries you've had. Which you know maybe for most of the population might be fairly might seem fairly straightforward, but in order to sort of account for <clears throat> the variety of types of people there are, I think it's important to represent all of these things together. And you know, John mentioned it, and I've thought about it. Like, do we maybe need a sex and gender ontology? Okay. And things outside the doctor's office. Um, you can customize your sim's gender now. I forget exactly when this drops, but um, they had this sort of gender customization in The Sims. And they worked actually with um, Vlad, was the, the gay, lesbian, anti-defamation, or they might just be Vlad now, they might have gotten rid of the acronym. Anyway, they worked with um, a group that focuses on LGBT rights, to sort of get a, a respectful representation of gender <laughs> customization. And so they, they have a physical frame, masculine, feminine, clothing preference, masculine, feminine, and then this thing will be able to get pregnant, get others pregnant, or neither. Can this same use the toilet standing? Yes, no. So it still looks kind of binary, but, you know, I feel like, you know, we're getting there. And um, also, you probably noticed Facebook has numerous options for gender identification, <clears throat> but at the same time, they will still take down photos of breast cancer survivors sharing their surgery scars. Um, I also saw a video of uh, like a breast self-exam where they're like, we can't show a woman how to do it on her own body because they'll censor it. So we'll show you how to do it on a man's body instead because apparently male nipples are okay and female nipples are not. <laughs> and I've even- I saw that video. Yeah. 
I, I forget, there was a, a documentary that I heard about as well where um, it was uh, a person who was female to male um, was, they wanted their surgery and their sort of their the process of their transition documented. And they went through uh, what's called the top surgery, which is uh, for uh, female to male is the breast removal. And like, apparently for half of the video in the surgery room, they censored the nipples. <clears throat> And then at some point they stop censoring the nipples <laughs> and it's just like it's this it's literally the same nipple <laughs> but yeah so it's you know we still have like some sort of social barriers to overcome um i got I have a few more wraps here that i was just looking at um including uh some of the some of looking at um specifically transgender patients um, so there's some studies that have been done. I need to dig into this more um, to see sort of what things they're researching specifically. Um, other than, you know, like I said, HIV is a very common thread in um, transgender studies. Excuse me, and also just in um, the, the, the migrant. I get migraines, so I was reading migraine articles, and apparently they're, they've linked it to estrogen. And um, thanks for calling. Questions, yeah. comments, pictures of Chloe. <laughs> so, so first, let's. <laughs> so, the, um, so you listed, you know, starting with snowmen, you listed mm -hmm. several ontologies, and to, you know, to a, a big extent, these are kind of use case driven. Right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, each one is coming from an application domain. So, mm -hmm. um, and there's a, um, sort of, there's a couple failures. One is. Uh, a failure of that application domain to require mm. more expressiveness. Yeah. Okay. Um, but also, there's always a failure of imagination, which is a kind of a big part of what we're talking about. So, mm -hmm. how how do these evolve, or do you need you know another authoritative ontology mm -hmm. like we were chatting about that kind of present mm -hmm. this, and then they they kind of get. I guess, Subclassed in. <laughs> yeah, I guess like my my from what I've seen of you know my my work on medical domain projects is they really like having spreadsheets and boxes to check, and so I feel like if we you know sort of provide like multi-axis sort of thing like you know looking at birth certificate versus um, self-identified gender versus you know levels and so forth, um, you know sort of like providing those those sort of boxes to fill out will sort of be like here here's more that you need to think about in a way sort of i guess like essentially break out out of the, the schema that we have right now which is just mf checkbox maybe with the intersex maybe with the unknown so do you actually see like a <laughs> so yeah so we have mf or and i don't want to answer kind of, you know, yeah that's yeah kind of a generic thing um but part of what you're, I think, I think what you're getting at, or even maybe between the lines, mm -hmm. is um, what what is the question that needs to be answered? I mean, why? Mm -hmm. well, you know, they, they, it's been so simplified that mm -hmm. they're kind of overloading M and F yeah. with lots of different mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they're in order to to make some of these to to, to draw out some of these distinctions mm -hmm. you, you, um there is what do you actually need to know what, mm -hmm. what is the information that needs to be known yeah in, in the um in the medical record yeah and also so that's one side of it what needs to be specified but also part of what you've said is we got to train doctors for example or researchers yeah. for example on what they need to know. You know, mm -hmm. some of that just we don't have the trials yet. Yeah. We don't have the medicine yet actually to know what to ask. Yeah. Basically a lot of what it boils down to now is more and more elaborate ways of asking what's in your pants, <laughs> which well, offends a lot of trans people and often isn't really getting at what information they you know was really required, I think. So well, and part of it was not, in, you know, and I think, you know, Brenda's talk last, was it last term, last yeah. spring, um, that's, that was coming in one direction, mm -hmm. 
we really, really need to know and do these studies to do mm -hmm. medicine right. Okay, so that's one end of the yeah. spectrum. Another far end of the end of the spectrum is you don't need to know. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's two sides of it. You know, there's yeah, it's sort of like the the intersectional feminism issue is you know we talk about you know women's health, women's clinics, women's rights, you know, in the medical domain. But also, you know, like I was saying, like, where is a woman, where can she go to safely and comfortably get screened for prostate cancer if that's something that she requires, if that's a procedure that she requires? Or um, how can you help uh, a, a trans man sort of, you know, get screened for um, cervical cancer, you know, and in a way that, like, the questions will be asked respectfully, they will be, you know, they'll be respected and that also that just meets their needs, so... And, you know, in a lot of cases, it sounds like um, trans trans individuals will avoid the doctor altogether because they don't, there, there isn't an obvious, you know, safe way to ask these questions and to get these critiques done. Isn't there a whole thing with the, the VA? Um, the one, one of the, I, I, maybe I'm remembering this totally wrong. Maybe I made it up. <laughs> but I thought that, you know, one of the, the, one of the defense department's arguments against you know trans in the, in the military was mm -hmm. we don't know how to deal with them mm -hmm. you know, from a medical standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, and the, and the, and the, and the, well, I say they didn't want to, they don't want to have to pay for any transition surgeries that might occur while mm -hmm. uh, you're, while you're covered under VA. Mm -hmm. Trans-related or right. yeah, trans-related yeah. surgeries. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. They don't want to make those. Or their treatments. Or their treatments. Like, right, because they're, they're lifelong. Mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. It's just a really elaborate way of saying we don't want you to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or because you want to do this, you're not welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so this particular set, so this is, is this a sub, uh, is this all that's in um, Snowman under this? or is They this? had on um, this, this they, they have gender as a subclass of general clinical state, and then they had this property is interpreted by, and mm -hmm. they had this this list of choices. And this is the list. Yes. So mm -hmm. the what's going on there? There's the the surgically transgendered transsexual male to female versus mm -hmm. surgically transgendered transsexual. I guess maybe is not. that more general or is that yeah is that female to male? Or well, there's there male to female, female, female to male. Then I guess. Oh, I didn't see that. I'm sorry, I didn't see mm -hmm. it down there. My other question is the trans community is steering away from the term transsexual, right? So yeah. that's also kind of we want to keep the literature up to date with what the community feels is appropriate. Yeah. Definitely. Um transgender is, is preferred now and you don't use it as a noun, like the transgendered it's you know, it's, it's it's an adjective. So. Oh, this is getting to your earlier slides, mm -hmm. yeah, gender versus sex. Yeah. <clears throat> so, is there any work going on in terms of ontology development in this, this space? Um, I was looking into it a little bit. Um, preliminary traveling found a paper from 2006 about ontology merging that said, as an example, you know, class male. Has gender only female, you know, or class male is generally male, you know, generally male. It's like very binary in that sense, and they're using it as an example. But um, I, I, I definitely want to do more digging to sort of see if anyone is looking into that. But yeah. So um, in terms of sports, um, so for a transgender person. Um, I guess a trans male, do you think they should play in the girl sports team or the boy sports team? And same in the opposite direction. And I say this because uh, I guess your upper physical structure might have an effect on how you perform in a certain sport. Actually, that there's, um, that I've been reading this kind of a lot in running, and uh, the evidence uh, shows that. Any uh, pre-transition, so if you're taking hormone replacement therapy, uh, transitioning 
fail the female or female male who actually um, going from female to male, you actually gain an advantage by taking testosterone that you would normally have if you would get a male, and vice versa. So you lose any advantage you might have had as a male if you take uh, estrogen to uh, to gain secondary sex characteristics because the, the muscle <clears throat> muscle tone follows the hormone mm -hmm. uh, that you're, you're taking, and the activity is actually being remodeled day to day. Long, I know that in the uh, like the Olympics, what is occurring there is um, so if, if if you are found that your hormones, you know, naturally, like you're not making a gender choice, right? So mm -hmm. if, when they're testing athletes, if your hormones don't fall within a particular range, they're now saying let's you're going to have to take pills to counteract that. And so if you're, you know, if you are female and you have too much testosterone, mm -hmm. that's they think of that as an unfair advantage. Mm -hmm. All of a yeah. So oh, it's like if you're a cisgender female who just happens to be right, yeah. who just happens yeah. to well, there's so there's, someone dealing with that today. Yeah. yeah, this so, is that right? that example is that that young sprinter. Mm -hmm. Ooh, yes. Yeah. It's just like I just want to run. Yeah. Right. 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 And I'm wicked fast. Yeah. You know, and maybe too fast. So let's mm -hmm. test, yes. you know. And that's really um uh, it's crazy. No, and it gets very. And I don't think that's in the ontology, yeah, I suppose. And if you think about that, there's plenty of medical conditions that you can test for your medical center, like polycystic ovarian syndrome. Yeah. The symptom is you have yeah. increased testosterone. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, and so it's like, you know, like I said, different. different. So, this is, what, well, different so this, is, this is what's really interesting is most of the time that wouldn't necessarily matter, um, except when there's perhaps a, a medical situation where it would matter or some artificial construct like whether you, we give you it's it's a potentially an advantage so you it's a a reason to take away your gold medal yeah or which bathroom do we let you hide in during some shooting did you hear about that yes oh, what that the how hard. scary yeah there was a school shooting drill at a school in virginia i think it was like a primary school elementary school and they had a, a transgender student and they, the part as part of the drill, they sequestered the students away and like the, the restrooms, the locker rooms, and they're like, well, we have this trans student, we're just gonna leave them outside yeah. <laughs> during this safety drill. <laughs> yeah. And just, you know, what kind of message does that send to like everybody? <laughs> well, so. Go to the bathroom first, maybe. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're gonna yeah, lock it behind you. Whatever stamp on your forehead. Yeah, basically. Um, I know that, like in the intersex community, there's big push right now. They do sort of assignment surgery. They sort of like, well, you don't fit in one of these two boxes, so we will sort of fix everything so it looks like it fits into one of these two boxes, um, which is, you know, obviously creating a big uproar in the intersex community because these are infants having operations done on them without their consent. Um, so I know that's that's going to, you know, if if we're completely discounting the existence of transsex uh, or intersex individuals uh, within that community and we'll be very hurt by that and it will sort of it will perpetuate what's essentially you know a human rights violation on intersex people to enforce you know surgery of that nature and it will definitely be a uh, massive problem for the transgender community and I think because you know if if if, if we if we sweep it under the rug and don't talk about it um we won't get more research and we just won't learn you know what we need in these communities like 
we might make advances, you know, we'll continue making advances in, you know, healthcare for cisgender women, hopefully, but, you know, we will still have these issues. You know, it's, it's kind of like with, with marijuana as well, with being illegal for so long, like we don't know the medical benefits because no one's been able to study it. So it will definitely set the research back. Um, and also just in general, people will, you know, we're already afraid to self-identify and, um, you know, it will only, it will force a lot of, you know, people who are already reluctant to seek medical care further underground. So. Well, you know, I can see it, this impacting, I think this is what you're getting at, this is mm-hmm. impacting medical research. Yeah. You know, government funded research where you would have, um, any number of, of surveys, national surveys that collect data. Yeah, and um, no one's going to check that box if, well, you know, well, you can get... If the, if the opportunity, so I was thinking, if the opportunity is even there to check an alternate box, mm-hmm. okay, if, the, if, if, if politics is requiring sort of a, a, a traditional casting of this information, you're going to continue to not collect su- sufficient information. Yeah. Okay, you know, mm-hmm. so, and this directly gets into What's to prevent? What's Eugenic to prevent programs. moving? Well, what's to prevent moving ahead on, and developing mm-hmm. um, ontologies which more accurately express or, mm-hmm. or richly express? Mm-hmm. It's things like you know, government policy that explicitly goes against that. You're not going to have the data collection yeah. which is going to leverage, you know, the, the, those vocabularies. You're just not going to have it because you're not going to pay for it. <laughs> you know, and you're, you're not going to give the opportunities like those. You're and you. The point you were about to make is, is people are going to be reluctant to check those boxes. I'm yeah. going to say they're not going to have those boxes. Yeah, they might, you know, it's already like, you know, the trans community faces higher rates of, of violence and so forth. And so, you know, it's already not the safest place, you know, very, very, you know, different parts of the country, obviously, but. Um, Except maybe on voter registration, in which case they know how to, to exclude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> I just said that. <laughs> but yeah, actually, some of the, like I was reading up on some of like the early sex education in, in the United States, and it was originally they they called it uh, there was a, a what they called a social hygiene movement <laughs> in like the early part of the 20th century, which was sort of came directly from like the social purity movements of the previous century, and um, it was essentially to combat prostitution and basically enforce the sort of Christian morality view over um, human sexuality. And um, as a side effect, a lot of those people were involved in eugenics. And you can imagine that sort of, it was, I think it was discredited later on, but obviously we still feel the repercussions of that now, the sort of moralistic view um, getting muddled with the science. I'm thankful we're putting this video out on the web to help inform those guys. <laughs> Any other questions? This has been a, a great conversation so far. Can you go back to your uh, biological sex slide? So, so looking at these, right? So, so you're looking across the chromosomes, you look across the hormones, right? Mm-hmm. Um, at what at what point? Is it generally thought of? Do you know, like, where do social roles uh, actually influence sex? I, I I imagine it has to do with um, designation at birth and sort of like what you're socialized as growing up. Okay. Um, you know, you you'll even see like you know they start marketing toys as as boy toys and girl toys very early on, and you know you do get like boys who are reluctant to you know, play with toys, you know, feminine and parents who are reluctant to let their parents, you know, to let their children play with toys that aren't gendered, they feel properly for their, their kids. And so I feel like that sort of the socialization starts very young, but it also mm-hmm. Oh yeah, gender reveal part. I don't I won't get started on this, but <laughs> but, yeah. but sometimes you don't know where it comes from. Yeah. You know, maybe it's, 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 there's lots of influences, and it's not necessarily overt influences. Yeah. It's not necessarily, you know, parents buying the little boy Iron Man toys and mm-hmm. you know, the little girl Barbie. Sometimes there's just influences that yeah. who knows where it comes from. But yeah. the media, 
So I just read a story on Twitter last night, actually, and it was this parent. Um, he's a very vocal father, even he has a young son. Mm -hmm. And it was this very long thread about how his son loves football, gets dirty, like loves, you know, very standard, you know, boy, but he also likes to carry around a purse because he likes to carry around his stuff. He loves reading the bright nail polish and he's a kindergartner. And his parents raised him very, you know, open and do whatever you want. He wore, you know, nail polish to kindergarten and the kids made fun of him. They call, you know, the kid calls home oh, right in the middle of the day, like, I'm not going to take the nail polish off and be like, all oh, the kids are making fun of me. So even if you as a parent do the right thing, yeah. there is, you know, sometimes I think the dad said in the thread, you know, five, this kid is five, five years of preaching, you know, love and honesty and one day in kindergarten yeah. because the other parents didn't do the same. So we need, yeah. we need to get to the point where we, as a society, say, you know, yeah. Society. But like, who cares if you wear nail polish or not? These are learned. These are learned. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is a huge point. Mm. You know, my my kids were very lucky that the um, the, the school system that <clears throat> they were raised in in Vermont was one where there were lots of two mom families mm. and a few two dad families and those sorts of things, and and it was in fact the norm. Okay, mm. um, and and. It's it's a pretty special environment at least kidding because they you know it's a normal thing all the way through it, um, and uh, it's a pretty rare mm -hmm. rare situation so it it uh, uh, so, yeah, it's so yeah and, and, yeah well so at least the school I'm not saying that the other parents were necessarily as you said doing the right thing yeah uh, at least the school was doing the right thing. And the, and the fellow students mostly were doing it right. Other other questions. So I thought this was going to include a why is demo and a <laughs> SED. Yeah, it's really good actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. SDG, semantic gender definition. Yeah. No, you got like oh. the. No, so one more question. Uh, how would you, is there, do you see a solution for how to change the birth certificate to, you know, do we, do we have to have a chromosomal test when an infant is born? I hope we, not. Well, <laughs> the memo said that. Yeah, that the memo old, the old said way that any change is by doing that. I don't feel like, like, personally, I think that would be pretty, that would be very basic, you know. But is there a solution? Do we exclude completely gender completely? You know, sex is sex exclude? Or? I mean, I think it's you know having it. You know, if the government wants to know, you know, male or female, I don't know. I, I feel like there's no like easy solution to it, especially because it's something that we're very accustomed to. Um, but I also feel like it should be easy to change if you self-identify differently. Right. Um, this the, the laws are different from state to state. Um, that was really creepy. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, some laws require like notes from the psychiatrist to get your birth certificate or your driver license, driver's license changed. Some of them actually require that you have proof you've undergone gender reassignment surgery. Um, I was reading a little bit about some other countries. Apparently, there are some countries in Europe that actually require you require forced sterilization to undergo surgery. Uh, like they, they, you must be sterilized, and I think in some cases, do we have some cases like your eggs or sperm or whatever? You can't have any like frozen and save for later to go undergo gender reassignment surgery. And so just like, you know, just like the the laws are different from place to place, which complicates everything. But I think what's the actual purpose of a birth? Oh, the birth certificate. Yeah. What's the purpose of a birth certificate? Yeah. Identity, basically. Yeah. Right. Person. Okay. And it's. Easier to identify if you exclude half the population. But so I guess my, my point is, you know, isn't isn't it sufficient to say um, so? Uh, well, so it is. my wife's birth certificate actually said baby girl Carrie, her baby name is Carrie. Yeah, um, so actually, <laughs> so that's that's a great job. There are some yeah. states that uh, don't require recording of a uh, sex at birth mm -hmm. on the birth certificate. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, and that's specifically to accommodate intersex conditions. Mm -hmm. right. It seems like you know if you want to do it for identification, you know some fingerprint. Yeah, like yes, fingerprint. Well, or basically, the, the footprints are already yeah. for the reason why gender has been on birth certificates because gender has been on birth certificates. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at like church records, baby girl born to so and so and so and so on such a date, mm -hmm. and that's the birth, that's the the birth of birth certificates, and that's pretty much where it came from. Mm -hmm. It's just it's a cultural artifact. Yeah. Why do we even have birth certificates? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm the one that asked why we have birth certificates. I know mine doesn't show it a whole lot. Oh yeah, yeah. It's right? kind of, it's it's so, kind of the start of the census process, but the thing is, is that there are many systems of, of tracking identification that we do right. um, that you know don't you know basically the idea is that they want to be able to, to trace your family. Exactly. Yeah. It's basically yeah, it's a social process that we've been doing and so that's why we keep doing it. Yeah, and and actually it's a pro it's something that emerged, I think, in the early nineteenth or twentieth century. Yeah. Because I do remember, you know, as as we talk about this, um there didn't used to be birth certificates. Yeah. You know, there there was some record in the um you know in the the church yeah. record. Right. And the other, th the other thing is, as uh, birthright citizenship became uh, a guaranteed mm -hmm. thing, that became oh, that's probably, yeah. 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 Oh, we might not even have that. <laughs> it's hard to be so depressing. We're going to have to move towards Cuban I'm afraid to admit it, but I, I, I think so. Oh, the, 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 it was the, the Vulcan philosophy, uh, infinite diversity, and infinite combinations. But you know, it, it is an interesting challenge as you, mm -hmm. as, you know, as you think about um, defining or well, defining medical studies, mm -hmm. defining clinical trials in, you know, that are sufficient so that you get some understanding, but also. Um, which conditions don't matter, which conditions, or which states of, of existence matter and don't matter, mm -hmm. and how can you map those onto others? So, so it was being able to divine those out of, out of studies so that you can um, know it's really important or know it's, it's not important. And also collecting people, they'll send out, you know, calls for, you know, certain, certain types of people and, you know, there will be um, like some of the the, some of these, like, the, there are different terms for different racial communities. Um, like, I think, sort of, like, what we think of the, what the, the butch lesbian, the sort of more masculine presenting lesbian, I believe they call them studs in the African American lesbian community. So, you know, if you put out a call for, for butch lesbians, are you going to have, you know, black women attending? Are they going to show up? And so you sort of have to, there's also the, the race factor is also really intricately tied in, uh, especially with, like, the, the LGBT community a lot of difference in terminology, difference in everything really. So it's like So as when you I'm sorry, when you when you put this up before, mm -hmm. what what I was kind of thinking of is this is so this is at, at first glance, this is a collection of different you know, of, of vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But it's also it's very purpose driven. You know, mm -hmm. these you know these aren't all interchangeable. There's mm -hmm. these are these are coming from different they're there um, to have where distinction is perhaps important mm -hmm. in certain situations or yeah. situational or or mm -hmm. about you know that they're application specific in, yeah. in many ways. You're gonna use them in some places, you're not gonna use them in other. Mm -hmm. and, and that was kind of what I was thinking of before is like where it's important to specify you need mm -hmm. to have these sorts of things. And I imagine there's probably situations where they are, you know, where you get to select. 
yeah, for, like, for whatever reason. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'll tell you something that I heard. I was at the um, uh, inter, not international, uh, interdisciplinary um, association for population health sciences conference. Okay. And uh, one of the lovely things I heard someone say was that biology is too important to be left to the biologists. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so this is, I think, what you're doing here. It's really important. Mm -hmm. So you're saying we should turn it over to the ontologists? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the thing is that the, a lot of these things actually is be, are being validated by biologists in places where, you know, you, you wouldn't even you wouldn't have seen uptake by, even by psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of these states, uh, if, it, if there wasn't kind of biological underpinning. And uh, so I, I mentioned to Katie the idea of, the, of uh, birth, jet, birth sex being the first principal component of, <laughs> of uh, whatever the whole thing is, uh, because it's actually it's, it's a combination of, you know, like. 20, 30 different genes expressed in different ways mm -hmm. and being regulated, cross-regulated so, and regulated. Right. It's a complex it's a complex mechanism. So it can go different. Anyway. Are you and proposing eigengender? <laughs> eigensex? <laughs> well, eigengender would be like everybody cooks at Thanksgiving, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> anyone can mow the lawn, anyone can do the laundry. Yeah, yeah, watch the kids. So, right. yeah, it's definitely a feminist issue in, in the sense that, you know, moving away from the, the white cisgender heterosexual male perspective to be more inclusive. So, but I think, you know, we also help, I think it would help serve, you know, male communities as well if we just look at different, you know, we, we, we say like, oh, if you have like a vasectomy, that's, you know, you, you're, Loss of primary sex characteristics, but you don't stop being a man. So, you know, we have to take things like that into consideration, you know, also. Let's clap. Okay. <laughs> so, so